Now let's study another very convenient pair of derived rules that goes under the collective name of quantifier negation. This pair deals with the interaction between negation and quantification. So we have one rule for the universal quantifier and another for the existential one. A typical case in which these rules come in handy is when we need to exploit a quantifier, but that quantifier occurs within the scope of a negation sign, as in this sentence. Existential exploitation can't be directly applied here because it can only be used on sentences whose main operator is an existential quantifier. And in this case, the main operator is negation. In cases like this, what we do is derive an equivalent sentence by driving the negation inwards, to the right of the quantifier. Now, when you push the tilde inwards inside the scope of a quantifier, two things happen. One, the negation goes to the first place available to the right. And so it ends up being attached to the first complete formula it meets on its way in. Second, and very important, the quantifier is flipped from existential to universal or from universal to existential, depending on where you started. So let's start with the first rule at the top. Not every x is fx. So you switch the quantifier. It was universal, but now it's existential. And put the negation at the next available slot. In this case, in front of the open sentence fx, which is the extent of the scope of the quantifier. So we get not every x is fx which is equivalent to there is an x such that it is not f. This rule is written with four dots because it is an equivalence rule. You can go from right to left and from left to right. And if you look at it, it makes sense. Consider the pair of English sentences, not everything is fun and at least one thing is not fun. It is clear that these are true in exactly the same circumstances and so are equivalent. Now for the bottom rule. We start with, it's not the case that there is an x that is f. Then we switch the quantifier from existential to universal and move the negation to the right and we get every x is such that it is not f. This is very intuitive. Also, as I just mentioned, this is an equivalence rule, so we can apply it in either direction. Hence, if you have there is an x not fx, then you can push the negation outward not inward, as we do in the other direction, and then switch the quantifier from existential to universal. Incidentally, notice that this pair of rules shows that the universal and existential quantifiers form a dual pair under negation. We also saw that conjunction and disjunction and the virum and the falsum form dual pairs. In the same way, the universal and existential quantifiers are dual operators in predicate logic. So there is an x such that fx is equivalent to not every x is not f. And every x is f is equivalent to there isn't an x that isn't f. I leave the derivation of these equivalences to you, but suffice to say that you only need quantifier negation and double negation to do it. Okay, let's work through a full example. Suppose you want to show that this argument is valid. Now, if you take a second to compare the premise and the conclusion, you can see that they are identical in structure, but with two crucial differences. The first one is that whereas in the premise, the negation has the widest scope, since it's all the way to the left, in the conclusion it has the smallest scope possible, as it occurs to the right of all quantifiers. The second is that instead of universal quantifiers, now we have existential ones. So it looks like we're going to have to push the negation inwards, as far to the right as possible. And we also have to switch the quantifiers from universal to existential. Both of these things can be accomplished at the same time with the quantifier negation rule. However, we can't do it all in one step. We need to swap one quantifier at a time, and also we need to move the negation to the right one place at a time. So on line two, we move the negation to the next available place to the right, and then change our quantifier from universal to existential. Thus, we end up with this intermediate sentence, which is equivalent to the one on line one. Then we annotate this as QN, which is short for quantifier negation, on line one. The second step on line three is going to be basically the same. 
Leaving everything else untouched, we move the negation sign to the next slot to the right, which is right in front of the sentence LXY. And then we replace the universal quantifier with an existential. The justification is QN, line 2. And so we have arrived at our conclusion in two applications of quantifier negation. Now let's look at this next example. We have these two premises. There is an X that is F or G and not there is an X that is G. And the conclusion is there is an X that is FX. So you can see that at some point we're going to use the disjunction elimination rule. The colors are here to help you see the correspondences. But in order to do that, we're going to have to do two things. First, we'll need to get rid of the quantifiers in both premises. Second, in line two, we're going to have to drive the negation inwards so that it directly applies to the sentence within the quantifier scope. So let's get started. Okay, here are our premises. In line three, we can begin by applying universal quantifier negation. This has the effect of pushing the negation to the right. This is by QN line two. By the way, at this point you can forget about the sentence in line 2 since we won't be needing it any longer. However, we still need to get rid of this universal quantifier in line 3. But before we rush to apply an exploitation rule, let's pay attention to the fact that we have two quantified sentences in our list. One is existential on line 1 and the other is a universal on line 3. Remember that we always exploit existentials before we do universals. So we're going to start by exploiting the existential quantifier in one. This requires, as you remember, opening a subderivation. No name letter is being used in the lines above, so I'm going to use the first letter that comes to mind, which is A. This is not very creative, but it's useful to have a default routine and a go-to name. So on line four, our assumption is FA or GA, which is an assumption for existential exploitation. At this point, we are in a position to exploit the universal in line 3, using the letter that's already in our name inventory. So on line 5, we write not GA by universal quantifier exploitation, line 3. Now we're finally rid of those pesky quantifiers, and we simply apply disjunction elimination on lines 4 and 5, which on line 6 gives us FA. So we write V elimination for 5. So we are ready to reach our conclusion. As you can see, FA, the sentence in 6, is simply a substitution instance of there is an X FX, which is our target sentence. Hence, we can simply existentially generalize on FA, and so we get our target sentence by existential introduction on 6. Now we can finally close our subderivation and we can discharge our assumption. And on line 8, we simply copy the contents of line 7. There is an X FX by existential elimination on line 1, which has the existential we are exploiting, and lines 4 through 7, which encompass the subderivation that does the unpacking. Now let's do this other exercise. Again, we have these two premises, and then the conclusion is, for every x, if x is h, then x is j. Now notice the form of the conclusion. This is a case in which the form of the conclusion is going to dictate the form of our solution. So the conclusion is a universal whose body is a conditional. So what I would like to get is a conditional sentence like this. I'm using the letter A because it's my first choice. In this sentence, then, the name would occur arbitrarily. And so we would notate it with a little hat on each of the letter's occurrences. And since the name occurs arbitrarily, then on the following line, I would be able to universally generalize on this sentence. So I would replace each of the A's with an X and then preface the whole thing with an upside down A. This would be an application of universal quantifier introduction and it would be the last step in the derivation of our desired conclusion. But in order to get this required subconclusion, if H A then J A, I have to use horseshoe introduction. So I would start a subderivation using H A. And then, after some unpacking and manipulation, I would get JA. And so I would arrive at this intermediate sentence, provided I made sure that the name letter occurs arbitrarily. So this is what we're going to do. First, we're going to derive the conditional that's within the scope of the universal quantifier in our target conclusion. 
And since the resulting conditional will contain an arbitrary name, this will allow us, in the last step, to introduce the universal. And then we'll be done. Okay, let's do that. In accordance with our plan, on line 3 we start our subderivation and use HA as our assumption for horseshoe introduction. HA is the antecedent of the conditional we want to get. Now, the goal of this subderivation is to get JA, the conditional's consequent. At this point, we have two quantifiers occurring in the premises, which we'll have to exploit. However, you can see that the existential in line 2 can be exploited as it stands right now, since it occurs within the scope of the negation. So our next step on line 4 will be to push the negation inwards, by means of quantifier negation. In consequence, we write the result of the application of this rule, which is every x not not fx by qn line 2. So we have two negations in a row, but we can get rid of them by applying the equivalence rule of double negation. And on line 5, we write every x fx by dn on 4. And now we have two universal quantifiers that we can exploit. So we do that. And on line 6, we get fa by universal quantifier exploitation. Notice that we are substituting with a because this letter is already in use. We don't have ja yet, but we still have another universal sentence we can exploit, namely the one on line 1, and we can exploit it using the letter name a. So on line 7, we get not fa or if h a then j a by universal exploitation, line 1. Now compare lines 6 and 7, and you can see that the sentence in 6, that is fa, is equivalent to the negation of the left disjunct of the sentence in line 7. So it looks like the stage is set for disjunction elimination. Strictly speaking though, to apply that rule, we would have to have not not fa, which is the direct negation of the left disjunct of 7. However, we can skip that step by applying a rule which we can call disjunctive elimination plus, which is defined as a sequence of double negation on one of the sentences and disjunction elimination on both. So let's say that we have if HA, then JA, by disjunctive elimination plus on 6 and 7. Now focus on lines 3 and 8. You'll see that 3 contains the antecedent of the conditional in 8. This means that we can use conditional elimination on this pair of sentences to detach the consequence of 8. Therefore, on line 9, we get JA by horseshoe elimination 3, 8. And JA is precisely what this subderivation was aiming at, so we have reached our subgoal, and we can seal our subderivation shot and discharge our assumption. On line 10, we write if HA then JA by conditional introduction on lines 3 through 9. Very well, but notice then that the occurrences of A on line 10 are arbitrary. Why? Because A doesn't occur in any of the premises of the derivation in which 10 itself occurs. You see, by the time we reach 10, the subderivation is already dead. It doesn't exist anymore. So the only sentences that belong to the subderivation of which 10 forms part are those occurring on 1, 2 and 10 itself, and in none of them you'll find A. So on line 10, the name A occurs arbitrarily, and we can mark this by adding a hat to both of its occurrences here. And that gives us license to infer the universal generalization on this sentence. So on line 11, we start with a universal quantifier, and then place the conditional in 10 within the scope of the quantifier, while at the same time replacing the arbitrary occurrences of A with the same variable introduced by the quantifier in the front, which in this case is x, and then we write universal introduction, line 10. So we have reached our conclusion, and thus our derivation comes to an end. This is all for this lesson. Thank you. Goodbye.